ReasonConf is brought to you by our gold sponsors, Ahrefs and Chain Street. Hello, everybody. That's the energy I want to see. The last talk. Wow, you probably all just want to get the fuck out of here. We do have to do one thing, though. We're going to take a quick selfie. I got to send something to my mom. She doesn't believe me that I'm in Vienna right now. So let's make this happen. Just clap. If you don't want to be in it, you know, just hide your face. But all right, ready? On a count of three. Ready? Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Okay, sick. Thank you very much. Now I'll present. Awesome. So anyway, my name is Peter Pykarczyk. A great way to remember it is pies, cars, and chicks. I am Polish, though, so it's technically pronounced Piekarczyk, but I won't hold it against you otherwise. I love to cycle. I go on long-distance bike rides in Chicago all the time. I'm a huge fan of Reason, obviously. I'm on stage at ReasonConf. I love Expo and React Native. Those are other technologies that we use at DraftBit. I'm actually Expo's first user, which is pretty cool. I love plants. If you know of any botanic gardens or just like sick plants that you've seen, please let me know. I have like an Instagram of all like my plant travel pics. I'm a Y Combinator alum and I'm a co-founder of DraftBit. The last talk that I was at, they made fun of me because of this profile picture. I took this a few years ago. I had long hair, different glasses, no beard. And I think it's time I need to like update that. I don't know if this is the picture that I'm going to go with, but I definitely can't go with the first one anymore. Okay, so now let's get started. Before we jump into the hiring, I have to tell you a little bit about DraftBit, the startup culture, my team, and just sort of like the way we build our product. If you haven't heard of DraftBit, DraftBit is a platform to help you build mobile apps visually, specifically Expo and React Native apps. If you haven't heard of Expo, it's like Rails for React Native. They streamline the process. You don't have to worry about Xcode or Android Studio or working with CocoaPods and Gradle. It just, you just write JavaScript and you're done. And the cool part about Expo is everything lives in S3. So you get this one JavaScript bundle file, right? And then when you are using Expo and writing code, every time you save it, it updates that bundle and then sends it directly to your phone. So now you're running things directly on your phone that's not connected to the device. DraftBit takes a very similar approach. You scan a QR code, you drag and drop a bunch of components, and then you export that source code, right? So maybe you just want to export like a piece of it so you copy and paste it. Or if you've built your entire app through DraftBit, you can just click download project, and then we'll put all your images and assets and colors and type styles all together, and just, you just run like yarn start, and you're on your way. So, Here's just like a, quick, a quick teaser of what DraftBit looks like. OK, cool, it's working. Um, so one of my favorite things about this is those animations. Look how fast they are. I was so proud of my team when they showed me this. One of the most important things about DraftBit is the standards that we hold, right? We are an engineering company, and we want to deliver the best React Native and Expo apps possible. So we not only have to give you amazing source code, we also have to make sure that we apply those same principles to ourselves. Here's a little bit of a more realistic situation where you would use DraftBit. So you go to draftbit.com, right? So you've got the browser on the left-hand side, and you've got a simulator running on the right. I've got a Mac, so I've got the iOS simulator. But let's say you had Windows or whatever, you'd scan your QR code on your phone and can just continue doing things on your merry way. So we're building a push notification screen here, right? We've got the image. We've got some title. Uh, and what we have to do is add two buttons, skip and enable. You know the screens that I'm talking about. It's like, oh, like, welcome to my app. Like, you know, like, please enable push notifications to continue, right? Skip, right? Uh, so we're doing the same thing here. So what we've done is dragged over a few components, removed the icons, changed the labels, set justify content space between so the buttons get pushed down, and then added a little bit of margin to that top button, right? And we're finished. It's a very, very simple process, but the engineering behind it is very complex, right? We've got a lot of different configurations here. Uh, we're generating a lot of state. We're generating these beautiful UIs on the fly and then doing a live preview. So one of the most important things about DraftBit is the ability to build real-world apps, right? 
So at first, we started building uh, our own clones of like Instagram and Airbnb, right? But uh, it's like you can only build so many app ideas before you start building the same damn thing. So we started taking on a few just like uh, customers just to build out uh, different types of apps, right? We wanted to keep pushing the boundaries of DraftBit so that our users would love it. Now, let's talk a little bit about the fun stuff, the DraftBit stack. One of our goals is to be able to move very, very quickly without picking up much technical debt, right? We know what that's like. You can move and ship stuff, but it'll probably break down the road, right? So we do the best we can to balance that. And React and Reason has helped us a lot with that process. We also use Flowtype, WebAssembly, Expo, GraphQL, Apo GraphQL and Apollo, and lastly, Postgres, right? We try to write as little code as possible to achieve as much as possible. I think uh, Apollo and GraphQL are the most obvious examples in the last couple of years, right? On the server, we've been able to eliminate about 30% of our code. On the client, it's been like 70%, right? The less code you write, the less prone you are to errors. Now, you see, type, or you see flow type on that screen, and people always ask, why do you still use flow type, Peter? You know, it's like, because we do, right? Like, we've been a team, we've been working together the last few years, it was just easy to integrate into our workflow, right? And it just worked well with what we've learned from Reason. So TypeScript is great, you know, I love it, and it might work for you, but Reason is my thing, you know? Like, like I wear black, these dudes wear black, right? Like, I think I'm cool, these dudes think they're cool, right? It was just a match made in heaven for Reason and DraftBit. So we just continued along with it and have never looked back. Now, what does our Reason stack look like? Well, it's pretty obvious that we use Reason React, right? Reason GraphQL, BS Emotion, the Get and PPX, and GenType, right? We didn't use Reason GraphQL for a while, and I'll fill you in on, uh, about more of that in a second here, right? We didn't use BS Emotion for a while either, right? Get and PPX was awesome for when we need to find deeply nested optionals, right? But now, so you're wondering, why didn't you use these libraries at first? Well, because we weren't sure how they would all work out, right? We are a startup. There's only a handful of engineers. We can't just dive in on something and just like bet our entire business on it. So we've, we've started implementing things incrementally. And the nice thing about it is, GenType makes that a really good selling point for the rest of the team. If you haven't used GenType yet, I strongly recommend it, especially if you want to give Reason a shot at work, right? Come up with a simple component, a stateless component, maybe one parameter, right, whatever, and then you decorate it with gen type, right? And what happens is, if you've already got a TypeScript code base or a flow type code base, it'll automatically generate that type for you, right? So you can continue writing reason, and your coworkers can consume those types, be informed about what's going on, and carry on, right? It's an easy sell. It's not like, hey, we're going to build the next app in reason. It's like, hey, we already have this JavaScript project, Let's just try Reason, you know, like, let's just take like an hour, we'll put in a BS config, we'll install a BS platform, and see what happens. And that made it so much easier for my teammates to be a part of the process. Cool. So, like I mentioned, we are a startup. We like to move quickly. And that doesn't mean that all of our stuff is Reason, right? We slowly increment it. For example, the layers panel that you see here, right, the thing that once you drag and drop, you can uh, reorder things, you can nest things, you can duplicate and delete them, right? This is still in JavaScript, and it runs just fine because nobody's touched it in about six months, right? When we do need to revisit this, we will probably rewrite it in Reason, but we, don't just, we just don't do that ahead of time. This frame that you see here is running Yoga, WebAssembly, and Reason, right? We touch this a lot. We're constantly trying to improve this experience of being able to give you some sort of a live preview with one set of compiler instructions, right? Like, when we, we consume our code, we send it to the React Native side, and then we send it to this frame too. So you've got a good idea of what's going on without constantly having to look at your phone. The live preview and code generation stuff is now all Reason too, which is super exciting. Try writing like this like mini compiler with one other person it becomes a nightmare in JavaScript, right? It was such a nightmare, it was slowing us down so much, they were just like, fuck this, like, you know, like we're gonna take a little bit and throw it in a reason. So now, this configuration panel, 
So there's a lot of, go a lot of stuff going on, right? Every single like, setting that you can do, you know, every single component, whether it's linear gradient or blur view or text, view, image, right? We consume all those configuration options. And when we were first starting out, we wrote this in JavaScript because it felt easier. But now we're so comfortable with Reason that every new module is Reason. And it's like exciting to see things work, right? Like we're not going back and fixing them. They just work. Same with this navigator. See all this stuff? Like, this is all reason now. And we, these were things and steps that we took incrementally to get there, right? And that was one of the nice things about the software, just being able to, you know, uh, let my coworkers trust me, give me a shot to try something new, and then show them over time how, ni how much nicer things were. So in any sort of, like, uh, product sort of uh, life cycle or ecosystem, I always like to think of like the first version of this like cabin in the woods or in the desert in this case, right? And that cabin was our JavaScript cabin, right? You know, it could keep us dry from the rain, but if a hurricane went through, you know, like we would die, right? So these were the humble beginnings. Then what happened is like we started building on that cabin, right? Like we started adding more cabins, maybe some staircases, right? And then let's just say that those trailers are reason and the things that those trailers are standing on are JavaScript, you know? Maybe it's like aluminum, just kind of holding things together. Like, I hope nobody, like, touches this, right? <laughs> as we started growing and as we started scaling and having users use our software, we started doing this, right? And we're not completely here yet, right? But we're getting there. Now you're seeing more of this reason. And the JavaScript is going away. Now we're putting steel beams down next to that cabin. We're not getting rid of it just yet, but we're definitely shielding it, right? We are reinforcing our product with reason code that just works, letting the JavaScript do its own thing and knowing that eventually it'll probably disappear. Now, a little bit about what life is like at a startup. Maybe you've seen Silicon Valley on HBO. Maybe not. But, you know, it's not the most, you know, exciting thing. Well, it is, but that's to say it's not stressful. How many people work at a startup? Maybe tops 10 people, or, or tops 10, 15 people at your business, right? Uh, anybody? Anybody work with less than 10 coworkers? Cool. What about, uh, what about like a big company, like over 100, over 500, over 1,000 people? Anybody? I'm assuming the rest of you, if, you know. Unless there was like a 20 to 40, you know, bucket that I totally missed. But uh, anybody work at both before where you started with like five and now you're like, fuck that. Like I want to go work for a big company. Cool. So the reality of it is startups are hard, right? There's a lot of turnover. The salaries are low. There's so much work. And because you're working with like this small group of people, there's a lot of opinions that come with it, right? And unfortunately, there's not enough people to you know, deal through all those opinions and to get all the work done that you need to get done, right? Uh, so as a founder myself, I find myself just like working around the clock. If I'm not uh, reviewing PRs during the day or working on the business or debugging things, right? I'm coming home and working on the product, right? Sometimes I start work, you know, like writing code at like eight o'clock sometimes. So when it comes to hiring, what does that look like? Talk about a pitch. Hey, do you want to work for me? I can pay you half of what <laughs> you're used to with a six-month runway and no 401k. Uh, for those of you not from the US, a 401k is like a retirement plan, right? Try pitching this to people. It's really, really hard, right? So you need a little bit more. You need a little bit more than just you know salary and benefits. You got to sell people on the vision. So during Y Combinator in San Francisco, we were living the Silicon Valley TV show life, right? We had this three and a half million dollar house that we were in that the only reason we got to live there was because it was set to be demolished so somebody could put a mansion on it. But, <laughs> yeah, so here's the kicker. In Palo Alto, you can't just build a mansion. You got to petition it for six months. So that person let us live in this home that hasn't been like touched in 50 years while he petitioned to let the city build, you know, something bigger. The cool part is we got to live next to, uh, you know, just a three and a half million dollar home next to a barn where Perry from Shrek resides in. The same donkey from Shrek was our fucking neighbor. Uh, anyway, this was our living room, right? We had, you know, our, our office was the living room. See the curtains in the back? That was our intern's bedroom. He lived out of a suitcase and slept on a futon for four months. But 
like the craziest part about this picture is that three out of the four people are gone, right? And on a team of six, that is a big deal. And people leave for different reasons, right? Not just good or bad ones. So it's like a reality check. It's like, wow, now we have to hire three more people to make up for this time. So now, these are my young all-stars, right? Sebastian, Brandon, Angela, they're fresh out of school. They're uh, super talented, ambitious, and hardworking people. I always joke that if DraftFit doesn't make it, I'll end up working for them one day. Brandon and Angela have already given talks at the local Reason and React Native meetups, and I'm so proud of them. And there's a good chance that they will be up on this stage in a few years. I'll make sure that happens. Uh, anyway, here's a little bit more of what our team looks like, right? So we have five engineers and four other like business-related people. So every single person matters, right? When that breakdown is two senior devs and three juniors, we're spending a lot of time onboarding those people. Now, we're always looking for seniors, right? Always looking for somebody passionate in the vision who is willing to work with us, right? Who's willing to give us a shot. We can finally get into the fun stuff. What does hiring look like? Well, I think there's three parts, at least in my experience. There's the pursuit, right? So uh, just being able to pursue somebody and find somebody. There's the interview process, right? Of just like, what are we gonna do about it? And uh, then there's the onboarding process, the time it takes for that person to become effective. I'll start with the pursuit. So finding engineers um, is its own battle. I know we all face this, right? The first place I go to is my social circles, my friends, right? Because you're not gonna give a shitty recommendation. Uh, you know, like I would hate if I was just like, hey, yeah, use this person, they're senior, and then it would just like come back to me, right? Like we don't like to do that. So I always start with like social circles and friends first, just to see if there's anybody out there looking. Then I go to Twitter. I tweet about it, it gets a bunch of retweets, people come through the DMs, and you know, we talk, we see what makes sense. You know, if we can do remote, we'll do remote. If we can't, you know, no big deal. Um, meetups, I think, are one of my favorite ways. If you have people showing up to a meetup after work, excited or interested in a new technology that they don't get to use at work, that's already a step in the right direction. That's already hard to come by. So I really appreciate those people. LinkedIn is good, but LinkedIn is like casting a wide net, right? Like I basically scrape LinkedIn, I write a bunch of Chrome extension scripts, and then just like, you know, find engineers in Chicago and be like, hey, do you want to work on this cool platform, DraftBit, and see, and see who writes back. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And then lastly, recruiters. But recruiters are expensive. And sometimes a recruiter can make or break a startup, especially when they cost like 30 or 20% of the first year's salary. So sometimes we need to use recruiters, but we like to avoid them because of their fees. Okay, meetups, right? Meetups are my favorite. And lately in Chicago, we've had people from Clojure, Java, C Sharp, all from big companies showing up excited about this new technology, excited about Reason, excited about DraftBit. And you know, they're like, yeah, I get paid a lot and it's cool, but you know, like I haven't done anything cool, right? Like I kind of just like work for an hour or two a day and then I just kind of drink coffee and chill, right? So I'm like, oh, an hour or two a day, that must be nice, you know? You know so the grass is always greener. Uh, the, the funnel for these engineers is much longer, right? Because I'm not immediately pursuing them as, you know, as somebody that you know, I'd want to work with. I want to get to know that person, right? Come to a few meetups, let's talk. Let's build something in reason together and get to know each other, right? And that's like subliminally something like the interview process, right? So asking the right questions in a formal setting is super hard. So if I can get together with some folks and just build something in reason and figure out how they think, that's already a step in the right direction, right? In a more formal setting, what we do is we just ask like real world scenarios. It's like, hey, this is the thing that we're working on. You know, we're trying to figure out screen templates right now. How would you envision this working, right? From both an experience uh, background and then for like a user experience background and then from like an architectural background. Like how would you, you know, like what would, what would be the first thing that you test? Like what do you think is good enough to ship, right? And just feel things out, right? Walk me through this. So one of my favorite things is uh, looking for seniors, looking for a reason. And it's starting to crop up, right? Like I mentioned, we have people that have used these, you know, like older technologies. They want to do something new. They want to use the power of reason, but they can't. And the best part is they understand programming. They understand the fundamentals. So onboarding somebody like that becomes a lot easier, right? Because you're not teaching them, you know, like logic and programming from its finest. You're teaching them, you know, 
the reason way of thinking, you know, and then like they figure out the syntax on their own. So it's a pretty straightforward process. Now, onboarding, right? When we do onboard people, the way I like to think about onboarding is it's sort of like the period of time which an engineer becomes effective and productive, right? Uh, for a senior, that could be a couple weeks to a couple months. For a junior, it could be anywhere between a couple months to a year, right? It all depends on the product and the experience. We used to start with JavaScript. You know, I thought I was such a good guy, you know, like, you know what, don't worry about reason, get comfortable with JavaScript, and then, you know, once you're ready for it, once you feel like you're productive with JavaScript, we'll move you on to something more advanced like reason, you know? And then we had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of dialogue that went like this. Hey, Peter. Yeah. I think I broke something. Okay, let's take a look. 15 minutes and 10 console.logs later, it turns out that the API URL was spelled differently in two different places. And like, that's nobody's fault, right? That's just like common you know, engineering bugs. It doesn't matter how long you've been writing JavaScript for, you will encounter something like this, right? Like, why didn't I catch this on like so early? Well, because I was so like in the reason world, I forget that bugs like this like occurred. And I'm like, oh, duh, you know, like of course that was the problem, you know? Let's not even start with like undefined versus null and the things that happen with that, right? What about like onboarding a new developer who has never used Prettier or ESLint and getting, getting their editor set up? Or even just like starting a new project and getting Prettier and ESLint working together. What is that, 14 packages? You know, like how does it work with VS Code? What about WebStorm? What about Sublime Text? Uh, it just works with reason. That's one of my favorite things. I'm not going to argue with you about single or double quotes anymore or semis or no semis. You are just going to use whatever this gives us, and it's fine. And there's nothing we can do about it, right? Or at least that's what we say. So it just, that's just like 20% of our arguments disappear. Now, what, does, uh, what do the PRs look like, right? So when somebody starts with JavaScript, they go through an extensive review, right? For a file that's 500 lines, there may be 500 comments, right? And you may be reading this and being like, man, Peter, you're kind of a dick, right? So I asked, <laughs> I asked the person you know, that I reviewed this PR for, and I said, hey, am I a dick? I'm gonna put this in my presentation, so I need you to be honest. It's like, no, you're a hard ass if anything. It just means that you have a high standard of code. That being said, if it makes your presentation better, you can put me in there as long as you quote me. So I said, yeah, of course I'm gonna take a picture of this. Yes, you're a dick. Okay, cool. Uh, so what does that new first pull request review look like? It's the reason compiler, right? And the junior's always like, what? And I'm like, look at the compiler, right? People are so used to just looking at the browser, waiting for the page to refresh, and seeing that like, you know, like pink text show up saying like, oh, something got messed up. And I'm like, just look at the compiler, you know? And it like, and I'm like, look at the compiler, right? Like it's right there. I'm gonna tell you this is going to crash in a second when JavaScript has finished compiling, right? So, you know, after getting them into that flow, after like reading the actual compiler messages, right? After catching the little things, right? Like you've got a non-exhaustive pattern match, right? Like, I'm like, what do you do about that? It's like, well, you know, you, you exhaust it, right? Uh, you know, learning how to do all those simple things, like using optionals, right? Like, it just has made them so much more productive, right? Guess what? One month in, our juniors are productive with reason, right? They're not making the same mistakes anymore. API URL versus API URL, right, isn't a problem. Null and undefined isn't a problem, right? That being said, a compiler will not turn a junior into a senior, right? It will not. It will just help them stop making the same mistakes that JavaScript allows everybody to do, no matter whether you're a junior or a senior or have been writing JavaScript since day one, right? So my closing thoughts, the reason compiler is just a nicer version of me. And if that's good enough for my team, it's good enough for me. Thank you, everybody. You've been the best audience ever. Uh, thank you to uh, the Reason Association, to Patrick and Nick for having me. Thank you for, for just being here today. I really appreciate it. If you're into DraftBit, if you like the idea, just go to draftbit.com slash reason, and it's like your fast pass into the program. Otherwise, you're going to sit in that waiting list for like weeks or months until we let you through. So draftbit.com slash reason. Follow us on GitHub, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Uh, otherwise, find me in person, and I'll show you a demo. Thank you so much.